All right. Uh, today, I, what I want to do, the main objective of this presentation is really to get you off your iPhone, okay? And, uh, but the, the real uh, objective is, is uh, what I want to do is really address a little bit of the conflation that takes place when people talk about goals and objectives. So let me begin here. This is a quiz. How would you vote on this? It doesn't matter. I don't want to. Uh, I think I know what you're going to say, all right? How many have voted maybe? Good, 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 good. That, that shows. But why do you say maybe? I said, oh, uh, those, those of you that know German, uh, the question is, warum? <laughs> oh, por qué? Pourquoi? Oui, All right, that's the question I want to uh, really address today in, in some detail. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, the top three are the classical definitions of goals and objectives. But even Homer Simpson begins to realize that a goal can be an objective, but it depends on context. And that's what I want to discuss today. All right? Because when we choose a goal is a goal, an objective is an objective, and we don't say maybe, we are applying what principle in our mind? It's a false dichotomy. And the false dichotomy, dichotomy are premised on the principle of the excluded middle, right? So in, the, in Hal's opening a keynote presentation, he said, always ask the question. So when, I'm, so when I posed the first quiz, you should have, in your mind, you, you should have immediately kicked off the whole series of questions in your mind, all right? So that's what I'm about to discuss. Goals and objectives are hierarchically recursive. You have an executive manager, and he has goals G1, G2. And that executive manager frames his objectives as 01, 02, or 03, or 04, and 05. What must that manager do now? The manager cannot do 01, 02, or 03, or 05 by him or herself. He must delegate them. So what does he do? He de delegates 01, 02 to manager X. Goals 03 to manager Y, 04, 05 to manager Z. So the objectives of manager M become the goals at the next layer. And the, the goals at the next layer and manager X, Y, and Z decompose further into objectives 011, 012, 011, 2, 1, and so on and so forth. So a goal becomes, an, ob uh, an objective becomes a goal at the next layer. And that's uh, the principle of hierarchical decomposition and the principle of hereditary propagation of goals and objectives. Understood? Simple. And then so on down the line. A lot of people, when they see this, they say, hey, but Vic, this is a hierarchy. Organizations are networked. This applies to a network equally well. So I present it hierarchically so that it's easier for people to digest mentally. Now, throughout this morning and throughout this presentation, the question, especially this morning, the question was posed about cohesion. How do you maintain co cohesiveness 
of the goals and objectives throughout the organization. Well, this is uh, my experience, and in fact, is not original. It has been practiced forever in, or, in, in organizations. What you do is you create, what, well, let me first describe the problem. What happens uh, in organizations when you de decompose goals and objectives, and in, fa in fact, you delegate dollars? What happens is the objectives, when they become goals lower in the organization, acquire a life of their own. It's, it's kind of like uh, uh, planets orbiting around the sun. They, they have a centripetal force that tends to pull them apart. So what happens in organizations? The left hand doesn't know what the right hand does. So what, what do you have to do? You have to provide cohesiveness and cohesion. How do you do that? You create an executive staff called Sigma. And it's the role of the executive staff to provide the centrifugal force that tends to pull these diverse things to the center. And in the military, that's done all the time. It's called the staff. Who are the people in the staff? My experience is that the higher the level in the organization, the staffs are composed of experienced, savvy, multifunctional, and relatively young, promising people who can be future executives. And they can measure by the executive manager M as to how he can, the Sigma can bring cohesiveness and in, in integration to the various objectives that are propagated down the organization. So to me, uh, cohesion and integration is, is not a problem. It's a, it's a question of designing an organizational structure and a business process that works this way. I can go on through a lot of literature. I mean, my Belgian friends must know um, very well, and my uh, French friends here. What happened when, uh, why did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? One of the principal reasons, his chief of staff, Bertrand Berthier, committed suicide before the Battle of the Waterloo. So Napoleon did not have a competent and experienced chief of staff to coordinate all the activities that were going in the battlefield. You look at any senior executive that's extremely effective, I always say, search for the chief of staff. If the chief of staff is an experienced, capable person, Cohesion is never a problem. It's less of a problem. Now notice what happens. The further down the organization, uh, the tree you go, the more specific the goals and objectives become. The higher you go in this goals and objectives hierarchy, the more abstract it becomes. So, so so the question is really to make abstraction and specificity come together in a cohesive way, and that can be organizationally designed. So in summary, goals at level N become the objectives at level N plus one. Goals at level zero are the policy and the strategic goals. Level zero depends on teleological, ontological conditions and the unit of analysis against which this set of strategic goals and objectives are being applied. I mean, this is all in English, okay? Although teleological is a, is a four syllable word, but you can look it up. Now, this is, everything I said is very simply stated by these three equations. This set theoretic equations, right? Goals at level I plus one derives 
the objectives are level M plus I plus one. And the, all the objectives are level uh, I plus one must unify together to meet the goal. That's the first equation. The second equation says the set of all objectives must really satisfy the goals. And the third objective is a little bit harder to explain, okay? Because when I objective one and I mean equation one and equation two are really syntactic equations. What's, what is the most difficult part about language? Is the language is not only syntax, namely the organization of w w words, verbs, adjectives, adverbs together into a coherent sentence. What makes a sentence coherent is that it has semantic meaning. What makes a sentence that has semantic meaning actionable and meaningful for somebody to do something? That is called, it has pragmatic sense. This is not Vic Tang's original idea. This is every Revendish's paper on crawling into the back black box written with Paul Carlyle. Some of the most insightful articles really about organizational management. It defines how strat strat uh, goals, objectives, are really boundary objects which embody syntactically into a form which has semantic meaning, which is, has pragmatics, and therefore makes it actionable in a meaningful way. Hence, we get to, uh, I'll talk about that later, all right? Because I, I wanna pose a question at the end of this presentation. The syntax, all of you that are in SDM are very familiar with this syntax of a goal and objective. It's two by using subject two. It's a variation of Ed Crowley's uh, formulation. Two is a declaration of intent, an aspiration. This is the what. This is what you want to do. By is a statement of means. This is how you're going to do it. Using are assets that are brought to bear to the two by. And these are the with. You're going to do this with. Subject to. <coughs> constraints, assumptions, and these are the unremovable musts. Why is this important? <clears throat> this is important because it's totally consistent with what I said yesterday. By is capability. Using is capability. No, no, the first one is capacity. Using is capability. Subject two is readiness. So everything I say really comes together to one simple theme. All right, core idea, core principles. Here's one, right? What are the semantics? Goals specify a how. And the how defines the objectives. You have an objective. Why you want to achieve that objective? The question is why? That defines the goals. So you see this semantic relationship between goals and objectives. My apologies to Eric if I'm getting this wrong, OK? Uh, pragmatics, goals, why you want to when you, once you have a goal, how do you achieve the goal? How is by meeting objectives. How you meet objectives is by using assets. How do you use the assets? Subject to constraints and capabilities. Everything I say is consistent and coherent. Example, uh, I don't know, about three months ago, there was this brilliant article uh, in the New York Times business section. And the article described the problem that General Electric was facing and how the executives of the General Electric company were going to address this problem 
that uh, General Electric was having. The article was absolutely brilliant and its clarity uh, really reflected uh, the lights in the inside uh, of the riders uh, like an Antwerp diamond. The goal, remake the company. And they said, the goal is to eliminate bloat. That's a goal. By how? By focusing, carving, shedding, and cutting expenditures. It made it very clear. There's no doubt as to how they were going to do it. What are the things that they're going to be using to do these objectives? They say focus on wind turbines, light bulbs, less capital, and cut dividends. Is anything clearer than that? I don't think so. It's very clear. Subject to, by the way, we're going to cut 12,000 jobs. We don't care. <laughs> we're going to do that. We're going to depart from previous empire building, which was really a legacy of Jack Welch, and more financial discipline. Goals, objectives, very clearly stated and very clearly propagatable downwards in the organization. You look at the buy. Every buy can be delegated to a senior executive in that company or a division executive in that company. That's the beauty of clear goals and objectives. And that's the beauty on how you achieve really cohesion and buy-in and joint interpretation is that the syntax, the semantics, and the pragmatics come together in the two by using, by addressing the three fundamental aspects of strategy and successful implementation, capacity, capability, and readiness. Get that in your head. That's Vic Tang's uh, three rules. Now, Oops, if you're an economist, there's nothing mysterious about this. This is called the means ends chain. How many have heard of that? Right, it's a means end chain. Means, you have a means, you ask the question how, you go down the chain. And the, you ask how, once you have the first how, you ask the second how, and you go down the means end chain, and that becomes successfully decomposable. How do you go up the means and chain? You ask why. If you have are doing a how, you ask why am I doing this? You go up the means and chain and that becomes and identifies the goal. Which is why George Marshall, the brilliant, most brilliant uh, military strategist really in, uh, in the 20th century, he said if the objectives are clear and the goals are clear. I mean, if the objectives are clear, he said a lieutenant can express what is the strategy. Why? Because the lieutenant can go up the means and chain and derive the strategy and the policy. It's when that derivation cannot be done at low levels, it's when there is a disconnect and you create an implementation gap. So you go up the goals chain, you ask, why am I having these goals? And you see the top five bullets. The stock has gone down dramatically, 40%. There's a decline in the market share in product, every product line and so on and so forth. So we know the means and chain going downwards from the two to the subject two. I'm going to run over it. That's OK, because this is the first time I'm going to run over during this <laughs> conference. Uh, uh, we want equity and parity in treatment. Um, so I, I define three axioms and uh, four principles. Axiom one. Goals and objectives are syntax, semantics, and pragmatic boundary objects. They capture ideas in these three forms. Axiom two, poorly frames and goals are a guarantee of strategy 
this implementa implementation uh, gaps. That's very clear. Action two, I experience every day at home. My wife tells me uh, I'm, I'm very fuzzy and don't communicate clearly. Action three, well-posed goals and objectives follow the syntax of two by using subject two. Subject two, the semantics and the pragmatic rules of the Chomsky grammar. Those are expressible by equations one, two, and three. Actually, I could have made this uh, presentation in 60 seconds, but just presented the three equations. True? Maybe that was not practical, okay. Four principle. Principle of excluded reductionism. That's based on research. There's a famous uh, social scientist research named Ropel who wrote, objectives must be delegated to those who can and must execute. Principle of hereditary propagation. Cannot and must not omit any objectives in the delegation process. Otherwise, you're guaranteed to have an implementation gap. Principle of synthesis. Whenever you have a decomposition, you must bring that decomposition together as a system. That's the principle of synthesis. If you don't, you end up with a bunch of piece parts, right? Synthesis is therefore about semantics and pragmatics. They come together that way in, in the mind at a more abstract level. Cohesive interpretation and operational integration is not automatic. We know that, all right? Try herding cats, for example. Requires adult supervision. What is adult supervision? is achieved by a chief of staff. Finally, the principle of feasibility and actionability. All this is meaningless if it's not feasible or actionable. So those four principles and those three actions in these three equations really define goals and objectives, I think very clearly. Oops. Why is this important? You all read Alice in Wonderland, right? She meets the Cheshire cat and she says, tell me uh, which road to take. The cat says, well, it depends where you're going. Alice says, well, it doesn't matter where I'm going. Then the cat says, then it doesn't matter what road you take, but you're gonna get someplace if you walk long enough. That's Lewis Carroll. I mean, why say it in English? Say it in the equation, right? So we know goals, objectives, we know the actions, we, we know the principles, and we know the syntax, the semantics, and the grammar. What is there more that you need to understand about goals and objectives? Just go do it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Isaac, and this is a joint work with Nomi Baluka. We are from the Technion, the Industrial Engineering and Management Faculty. <clears throat> and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, my research deals mostly with uh, project management, and I develop models, quantitative models. Before joining the academy, I worked in the industry mostly in the aerospace and defense and IT industry as project manager, manager of projects, and a manager of organizations. Um, and I will, uh, I hope to speak today about uh, two of our models, but I will have time only for the first one, so I chose the most recent work, and the other work is in the articles that we submitted. So, 
I will focus on the project front end when uh, the amount of information that we have is the smallest or uncertainty is the highest, yet we have to make uh, important uh, decisions about technology and concepts that will be used, the project configuration, the due date, the cost, the price, and the project value. Those uh, decisions may be considered strategic, and they are mostly based on intuition, presentations, documents, iterations, which are by themselves very important. Yet models or model-based decisions have an important rule, an important role, and quantitative models as well are important decision support tools. And this is the focus of my presentation today. So the first problem is about robust project planning. And we view the model as a, a network of work packages with limited resources and multiple modes for each work package. What is a mode? A mode is an alternative to perform the work package. For example, if the aim, the target of the work package is to design a component, then two alternatives may be, one, to reuse the component from a previous or similar project, and the second alternative or the second mode would be to design the component from scratch. Each choosing each of these modes have impl impl implications on durations, resource requirements, and performance. And we consider the durations and the resource requirements as uncertain. So when dealing with uh, project scheduling or project planning, the common approaches are stochastic optimization, in which we optimize an expected uh, objective. For, ex for example, we want to minimize the expected duration of the project. Proactive and reactive scheduling, in which we insert time buffers between the project activities or work, work packages in order to absorb disruptions which will emerge during the project execution. Fuzzy project scheduling and robust optimization. Oops. Robust optimization, um, in which we want we want to optimize the worst possible scenario. We've seen certain limitations that I will speak about. When we discuss the problem of multi-mode planning, which is more relevant to the project front end, then the literature is just emerging on the stochastic uh, scenarios. And there are no models that use the robust optimization approach. And this is uh, what I will show immediately. So what is the problem definition? We want to select the modes or the alternatives or to define the configuration of a project and to allocate the resources to the project activities and work packages in order to minimize the worst case may span. So this is a min-max objective and the durations are uncertain but in our model, we do not assume any distribution for the activity's duration. We just assume that they belong to an uncertainty set, a concept which, will I, explain, uh, which I will ex explain now. And there is the subject two that was mentioned, two various constraints, and we are flexible in inserting uh, constraints. So 
we actually use the budgeted uncertainty set, but in order to explain what it is, I need to first explain what is an interval uncertainty uh, set. Each activity is characterized by a nominal duration and a maximal deviation from the minimal. This is how we, we describe the uncertainty or frame the uncertainty. So if I'm talking about just two activities or work packages, then each of them can, can be realized within an interval between its shortest duration and longest duration. And an interval set uncertainty, uh, an interval uncertainty set assumes that the blue area describes all possible realizations of these two activities. We can see that we have also the worst case scenario in which both activities are at the longest durations, and this may be too conservative. So we wanted to regulate the conservatism level according to the specific scenario and project, etc. And this is why we use the budgeted uncertainty set, a concept which was introduced by Bert Simas and Sim from MIT. And this uncertainty set has a new parameter, which is called gamma. And the gamma allows us to regulate the, the uh, level of conservatism. If gamma for this scenario equals two, then in fact, the budgeted uncertainty set is equal to the interval uncertainty set. If gamma equals zero, then we do not allow the uh, durations to deviate from their nominal duration, so we assume a deterministic situation. Let's see what happens when we choose another value. For example, lambda equals one, then this is the area in which we allow the combination of activities to be realized. We can see that we excluded the worst case scenarios, which are rare most of the times, from this uncertainty set. But if we want to be very conservative, very conservative, then we can use gamma equals two, and we will consider even the worst case scenario. So it's up to us. Okay, so I want to use a toy example in order to uh, illustrate the approach. And we have here only a single resource type. We have four units of it. This is the resource availability. And we have five work packages. And the gamma parameter equals three. So this is the project. It is described as a network with the blue arrows that describe the uh, precedence relations. And the triplet is, uh, on the left-hand side, is the resource requirements. The middle number is the nominal duration. And the, the right-hand number is the maximal deviation. And we can see that activities one and two have modes. First, we solved this problem to minimize the project duration by using a deterministic approach. And we can see in red the modes that were selected and the resource allocation, because we could not perform all activities in parallel using the resources uh, that we had. And on the right-hand side, we can see a diagram that describes uh, this, this project. And we can see that the, the optimal solution on the minimal uh, 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 duration is 15 time units when we use the nominal duration, okay? So next, what we want to do, we want to solve it using the mat mathematical formulations that I just showed by applying robust optimization. And I don't go into uh, much details, but we can solve this formulation in, uh, to optimality um, for uh, small instances and to near optimality for large instances. So we just applied the solution proce uh, procedures that we developed, and we came out with a different solution. 
in red are the selected modes, and the resource allocations are different also. And we can see that we paid something for it. So the project duration now is longer, again using the nominal duration. So it's 18 time units. So what we, did we gain? Now let's move to the part where the project is executed. And let's assume that subject to the uncertainty set and the uh, gamma equals three, uh, the, the worst case scenario is realized. In this case, we can see that the deterministic plan doesn't hold very well. The duration will be 26, and the robust duration will be 20. And we are guaranteed to finish the project in 20 time units for each of, of activ each activity realization, uh, each combination of activities realizations within the uncertainty set that we assumed. We conducted experiments um, with, this is ongoing, so we are uh, extending this, but with 60 projects, with 10 activities, three modes, two renewable and two non-renewable resource types. And we solved the robust optimization, the deterministic and anotopian policies that I will discuss uh, in a minute. Uh, we solved them, but we wanted to see how they will hold in execution. So we simulated each of these cases 100 times, and to imitate execution, we drowned the durations randomly for the interval in which they can be realized. And we observed the results. We used different parameters. Uh, this should be gamma. Gamma parameters, we changed uncertainty levels, distributions. Uh, uh, we compared deterministic, robust, and perfect information policy. What is a perfect information policy? This is the best solution. So in perfect information, we assume that we know in advance all the actual realizations of the activities or the work packages. So we can solve actually a deterministic problem in a hindsight. There cannot be a better solution than this, and this is a very hard benchmark. And on all these cases, the price of robustness that was paid was less than 77%, uh, which is modest, and the price of robustness is de defined as the difference between the robust planning and the utopian planning. And we saw that uh, robust policy outperforms the, the, the deterministic policy when delays are expected. And the variance of the results between the robust uh, policy implementation is smaller compared to deterministic planning. So to conclude, the robust approach is worthwhile when delays are expected. And the make spans are relatively close to the utopian make span. And the variance is small. So it seems that it may be a reasonable policy for many cases. And moreover, this approach guarantees that we meet the deadline for all realizations within the uncertainty set. But it may be too conservative if delays are not expected which is, I think, from my experience, a rare event. Our future work is to uh, develop an adjustable version of this model to use the information that we gained so far. So if we, are, uh, we have performed several of the work packages and gained some information, the model will be adjustable to this and will be able to change uh, the decisions. Uh, we will solve larger projects and develop some heuristics. I will stop. I will not go through the other project, but can you bring me to the to two slides before the end? Or I will go there myself. Okay. Oh. Can I go one back? Can I go one slide back? One back. 
yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, so thank you for uh, listening to me. And um, we see cooperation with researchers, postdocs, whatever. So if you are interested, just uh, contact me by mail or talk with me. Uh, we are developing now projects, a, a model that combine mathematics and human behavior, and we are interested in cooperation for this. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lisa Douglas. I'm with Rapid7. And I'm here to present some work that piggybacks on what we just heard about how we're thinking about what's going on in that gap and how do we help, from our perspective, how do we help our team actually um, move forward and go from the strategy to the implementation. And, and when I'm talking about this here today, and it's really a case study, is not so much the strategy at the executive level, but we've already kind of moved down the path, like Vic was talking about, we've taken the goals and we've, we've turned those into objectives that are then delegated down. So my work and my team and the work that we do is typically for teams that are somewhere in the middle who are below that executive vision, but also need to execute and have their own strategy. Um, I was tasked with coming to Rapid7. I work on the user experience team, and we have a lot of designers and we have a lot of engineers, and I was asked to come in and develop the actual research capability of the team. And one of the things that I brought with me is a love of Deming and the idea of systems thinking. And so that was part of my contribution uh, my background is human factors and cognitive psychology, but um, for some reason, I have wandered into the manufacturing world and completely and totally love it. Um, so uh, what I like is if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing, and I think that's, I think that's really telling. So um, what is interesting about the way our company is working is because they're bringing in trained researchers, typically with an academic background, that they're beginning to leverage the capabilities that we have to help other teams in the organization understand what their processes are, maybe think about how to measure their success and certainly improve their team's output and efficiency. And so um, I'm going to be talking about that. And um, before we had started the work with the teams that I'm describing today, we had started using concept mapping and systems thinking to even develop goals within our team, as well as understand when I first came in, there were just some very uh, dislocated capabilities. And so we actually use systems thinking to visualize what the system both looked like and what we wanted it to look like. So, um, so what we've done is this case study is all around how we are helping a completely restructured program management team understand what their systems look like and where their gaps are and how they can improve. And we, we use the concept mapping initially because we want to gain alignment across the team. There is something, like John was talking, there is something about being able to help people visualize their system, which tends to be very abstract, and, and have those visualizations. So even though they're not virtual, it's a way to all be looking at the same thing at the same time. And so they can understand uh, one of the things that we added to the systems thinking very deliberately was risks at different stages and how to think about that and then help them prioritize improvements. Um, so again, we used a systems thinking concept mapping and um, 
I'll talk a little bit about what we needed to get into also was when we're looking at the project management team, we wanted to understand explicitly what their strategy was and had they been able to articulate it. Um, so just a, a little graphic here to explain how we think about this is this is a concept map that we've created just generically to help you understand how we think about it. Um, let's see, where is, right here in the middle, this is what we call the aim of the system. This would be that high level goal that doesn't necessarily prescribe how to do something, but that you should always be able to go back up the chain and understand what the goal of the system is. And how we think here are these, how do we accomplish this? By what method do we accomplish the aim? And, and these can be considered the objectives. Um, important here is that we want to have inputs to the system. What is needed in order to, order to make the strategy happen? And then as you, as you move down through the mapping, you can actually blow out each of these by what method, the objectives, how do we get this done? So um, what we have here is the aim is the ultimate goal. Uh, things are ideas that would need to be in place to achieve the aim or to achieve it. Um, the results of achieving the goal are the outputs. Beneficiaries, we, we thought it's very important in the corporate setting as people are working through their actual understanding of, of how to achieve their strategy, who are the customers at different stages or at different levels of the system? Opportunities for cross-functional partnerships. This is um, a very big deal. Um, I work for an extremely hyper startup culture tech company and they're very, very interested in how do we do things fast, how do we work together, and how does everybody know everything in about five minutes? So those are really difficult things to accomplish. So one of the things that we've done with our concept mapping is to help the team understand where are the opportunities for collaborations across the organization. And then of course, how do we achieve it by what method? And so uh, one, of the, one of the foundations that we used is this idea of strategic management by projects and this idea of these critical integrative links and also looking at continuous improvement. And those were the two pieces that we kind of pulled out to help them with. And so um, again, here we go. This has all been said. Uh, the vision, the tactical work, and the communication gap. So um, what we want to do is uh, help that team come together, understand better how their strategy relates to an awful lot of different teams, being the project management team. And so um, real briefly in our organization, this is how the product life cycle um, is articulated, discovery, planning, implementation, and adoption. And so this is actually the concept map that we created for the project management team. And we did this by having a lot of interviews, gathering feedback from all of those stakeholders about inputs, outputs, their aim, their goal, how they wanted to approach things. And so here just briefly is um, the concept map. That was kind of the first stage of what we did. Then we, then we actually took this to um, a workshop and actually brought everybody together to gather further information. And one of the things that we did was we wanted to identify what are the aims. So when you go back, we have this large aim, this large overarching goal, but we also wanted to look at that across the life cycle. And so what are the goals that you're looking for um, at the discovery phase, at the planning phase, and then the color coding shows where there were similarities or the same theme was showing up across different stages. Then what we thought was extremely important was also to be identifying what are the potential risks that the team faces across the different phases. And so we went through these one by one um, and we, we didn't 
we wanted to make sure that everyone had time to talk about it at that particular at that particular stage of the life cycle. And so then what we find is that the discovery phase and the adoption phase, which is really the adoption and the execution phase, is that what happens is there appear to be a lot more risks at these stages than there are in the, in the middle of the project. And so now I'm bringing this back to the strategic dimensions or pillars that the project management team articulated to us early on um, in our analysis, and that these are, of course, they, they are related to the major goals that go way back up to the executive vision, but the team themselves had decided that these are strategic dimensions that we want to be able to measure against. So we took all the data that we had and we tried to understand that um, from the perspective of their strategic dimensions. The first thing that we did is we took all the definitions that they had at the pillar stage and we have now sub-definitions, sub-goals of what it is that they want to accomplish across the life cycle. So they didn't, they only had the, to have transparent singular inventory of all initiatives was the only definition that they had they had articulated. So we actually defined, helped them define sub goals at each of the project stages. We did this for all of them. I won't go through because I'm running out of time. And all through the execution stage. What this allowed us to do and what the team felt was particularly valuable was it allowed us then to look at all the risks that they had articulated not only across the project life cycle, but across the strategic dimensions as well. And so the goal for us was, uh, was again this idea of how can we present the data, how can we help them understand where their gaps are and what it is that they need to do moving forward. And so it was really helpful for them to see um, that, that they have a lot of communication issues that, that cross really all of the stages, but primarily the first three. And then you have um, some real risks with execution, of course, in the last stage. Um, again, we just showed them a different slice of the data so they could see that communication takes up the bulk of the issues really all across the project. And so one of the things that's allowing them to do is really focus, focus closely on their communication strategy. Um, and so really, um, I don't know how easy that is to see, really what we're looking at here is a model that's more of like systems thinking and a systems map along with um, strategic pillars or dimensions that are defined by the particular team, um, gathering alignment and being able to understand what the risks are there. And we're uh, now using this to actually work with another team, so we're trying to replicate it and see how successful it is. And we're also currently working with the project management team to help them improve the processes where they've prioritized as well as define some, some success metrics. Thank you. And we are also, um, completely, come please. We're also um, completely interested in feedback, in collaboration, in helping anybody gather data. If they're interested, um, we'd, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks. Didn't quite take. Yeah, so um, we have a, a discussion scheduled, but we also have a lunch scheduled. So if, if uh, you're willing, I'm going to um, ask the presenters from this last session to make themselves available during the lunch and during the breaks. And we'll move right into the next scheduled presentations, recurring patterns in organizations and then developing strategy that travels. Uh, so if we could just move on and, um, and then we'll, we'll get over to, um, over to next door and have lunch and, and move on with the rest of the program. Ready to go? Morning, folks. My name is Burl. I'm going to talk about a causal loop diagram 
model to help explain the gap that we're all talking about here today. Let's see here. Uh, this, these insights are based on consulting work I've done with uh, myself and my partners. Uh, viewed through, the, uh, there's a particular type of industry we're talking about, and I'll get to that next slide. Um, but these insights are all viewed through my experience here as, as an SDM student, um, my formative years as an undergraduate here um, in controls engineering, so purposeful use of feedback loops, not just the victim of feedback loops. And um, in our shared experience as naval aviators, uh, the industries we're talking about, in short, are the sources of human disasters. So important to all of us, even if we're not in those industries. So these are process industries. They're uh, typically mature, large, complex industries with um, do dominated by hourly frontline workers, dominated uh, financially by large capital investments and structure, uh, heavily regulated as they should be. So here's where we're going, a glimpse ahead. Um, and this spaghetti and meatballs chart here is um, a, the causal loop diagram. We're gonna build it quickly together. But what I wanna point out is that trust gap down the lower right corner. That trust gap emerges from, as do all systemic dysfunctions, emerges from um, actions on the on, that everybody involved in that organization is taking, and they make sense. Every one of them makes sense. No, no bad actors are required. No conspiracies. No stupid people are required. Everybody can do what makes sense at the time. And what you get from the interaction of all those adaptive agents is emergent behavior, and it in very clear patterns in the kind of companies we work with, and, uh, what comes out of that, among other things, is a gap in trust between frontline workers, implementers, and uh, management strategizers. So if they don't trust each other, there's gonna be a gap. So let's, uh, let's start with that little production, that little uh, simple model of a production machine we, um, it's, not, it's not a lot of rocket science to this, but we're suggesting the little tweak that may be unfamiliar is that the desire for profit and production is driven in large part by a sense of urgency. And that sense of urgency, in turn driven by increasingly downward pressure on decision-making time horizons. So we get short-term decision-making, that in turn is driven by short-term financial metrics, which are an externality for the discussion for, for this discussion. Uh, but when you think about you know the impact of arm's length investors, whether it's the public or the private investors, they, they tend to be driven by considerations of financial metrics that are in turn driven by how we think about our economy and what our expectations are for financial returns. So they tend to be relatively short term. And we, if those expectations are short-term, upper management's uh, decision-making timelines are gonna be no longer. And at every succeedingly lower level of hierarchy, the decision-making time constant tends to be lower and lower. By the time we get to frontline workers, uh, they, it's very common to find you know, the, the typical kind of get her done attitude, which unfortunately is often even a sort of um, implicit cultural value as if it's a good thing. And it's not all bad, but it can be dangerous. And so something to really pay attention to. And furthermore, that short-term decision-making is also driven by unplanned downtime, which uh, is internally generated. We'll talk, we'll see more about that. So here's the profit engine, um, again, balancing, at least in this model, a balancing loop on profit, a, a, as you would expect. Um, but what I want to point out is that open loop nature of that time horizon. So short-term thinking leads to sh short-term reliable profit. In other words, the very opposite of sustainability. 
All right, so besides uh, profit, another important metric for these kinds of industries, as you would hope and expect, is uh, safety, process safety in particular. So <clears throat> these, uh, these organizations all, almost all have some kind of investigations program. Investigations uh, should always be triggered by any incident, and an incident in this world is, uh, could be an accident or it could also be an event that could have been an accident. So all accidents are incidents, but not necessarily the other way around. All incidents should trigger an investigation. Uh, outside of aviation and the nuclear industry, what we regularly find is that these investigations are shallow, perfunctory in nature, um, and they're a chore, and they're often a response to regulatory pressure or uh, sort of, you know, management's and PR considerations uh, around what what appearances should look like. So they do investigations, sort of, but they tend to be very shallow. And the more they have to do, the shallower they tend to get. So another, some other influences on that sh the, sh the uh, shallow investigations are the short-term thinking again, and that short-term. This uh, decision-making horizon tends to also influence a couple other really important pieces of the organization. One is maintenance, preventive maintenance, and one is maintenance of the procedures. Because as you can imagine, written procedures are important, standardization is important, those kinds of things. But those two, both of those competencies suffer when we're when when there's this sort of constant chronic downward pressure on decision making time, and as a result, uh, you do get um, a failure of equipment. Of course, you also get, if you will, a failure of procedures, and so operators lose confidence in both of those things, and all that stuff affects their ability to do the job right. So. Operator competency is is materially affected, and then of course that leads to more operator error, and around and around we go. Some other influences on operator competency: leadership quality, uh, training quality, and uh, turnover. And turnover is driven by an, uh, another externality: the, the aging workforce demographics, and that's where a lot of the blame is often placed from within these kinds of dysfunctions. But workforce engagement is a, is a really important impact on 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 workforce uh, or on uh, turnover. <laughs> I, there are a lot of studies out there that support the idea that look, if if uh, people are less willing to make the switch to another company to another job, if they're engaged in their work, even if you try to pay them a little bit more money, but if they aren't engaged, if they really aren't on board, it doesn't take much to to, uh, to, to motivate a switch. So workforce engagement, big deal. But the big takeaway here is that all five of those influences on operator competency are really outside the direct control of the operators themselves. And that's vitally important. And it's a big clue to the solutions that, um, that present themselves. And here's another thing. Shallow investigations always turn up proximal causes, which always involve uh, at least one person and um, typically some kind of mechanical failure or, you know, maybe there's a, there's a reason for the mechanical failure that has to do with either preventive maintenance or, you know, supply chain, this or that. But the proximal causes are the ones that tend to get the attention in these shallow investigations. And as a result, um, Operators often get blamed. And if you're on the receiving end of that, if you've been, this is very, very common. Uh, we find this all the time. Yes, okay, so somebody didn't turn a valve that they were supposed to turn. And in fact, if you dig through the, 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 uh, through the documentation, you'll find that they were, in fact, supposed to turn that valve. And they didn't. It's okay, so they, they did something wrong. But Look, if, if, you, the, if, if your culture, if a thousand people before you have not turned that valve and gotten away with it, and your supervisor sort of purposefully turns his or her head when it's time to not turn that valve because it gets in the way, 
Um, the, the cultural and leadership influences have a huge, much, much stronger influence than whatever's written down, especially if whatever's written down is not fully trusted, it's not up to date, it's not completely standardized. So cultural and leadership influences have a huge impact here. Uh, so if you're on the receiving end of that, you start, to, you start to lose trust in management. At the same time, we have this spiraling uh, situation of increasing operator errors, which, again, makes sense at the time to these people involved. Uh, management tends to develop a distrust of the operators. What, what are those guys doing? So we have this bi-directional trust gap that's coming out of, and you see this is a three, three nested reinforcing loop of incidents. So incidents cause incidents cause incidents, and out of that comes a trust gap and unplanned downtime. Now, we've started talking here about some human factors issues. They're hard to quantify, tempting to shuffle aside and consider as issues for HR to deal with. Uh, but they're really important. And the, and the things I'm talking about are leadership quality, uh, trust, and engagement. So let's talk about how, how do we loop those in and make sense of those things. Well, uh, let's, for a minute, just ignore the trust gap and the leadership quality inputs to this loop. And you can see that this loop, you could imagine it either spiraling positive or negative in terms of innovation. It's a reinforcing loop. Um, one thing I want to point out is that decision-making time horizon, okay, just because you take a long time to make a decision doesn't mean that you're going to get healthy dialogue. Understand that. But the, but the reverse is true. If you, and we see this all the time too, with a downward pressure on decision-making times, a healthy dialogue, deference to expertise, and that back and forth that's required to loop people in at the front line so that they feel like they're included and they can buy in and they can be engaged, that suffers, and that's a common story. So then we have the influence of uh, leadership quality and the trust gap, and they typically, I, well, I, I don't know of a situation where those two things exist simultaneously. I, I think uh, in, in the context of our larger model, uh, they're possible and transients, but the kind of organization that has superior leadership is gonna not have uh, a chronic trust gap and vice versa. So now uh, here's the, what we call the innovation machine that links those three work uh, uh, human factors uh, issues together. Now, put it all together and we're back to the spaghetti and meatballs. There's some really pretty interesting insights that come out of this. Uh, first, I want to talk about that little corner down there. So when a trust gap develops, people on the front line tend to start protecting themselves. They, they protect each other and themselves from physical harm, from any threat to their careers or their jobs. Uh, and from having to work too hard, because I mean, after all, if you're really not bought in uh, and you don't really believe in the folks that are running the show, uh, why work more than you absolutely have to? And guess what that does? It directly feeds right back into the trust gap. And if you are not convinced of that, I have three words, blue lives matter. Think about the policing problem we have in this country. That is actually right there. Uh, Short-term decision-making, it's poison to the, every piece of this plate of spaghetti here. There isn't anywhere in there, there isn't a single meatball that isn't adversely affected by short-term thinking. So any solution or proposed solution that doesn't directly address that issue is destined to fail, in my humble opinion. Uh, and... <laughs> To that point, we, we have a, yet another reinforcing loop now around incidents. It was already a three nested deep reinforcing loop. And now we, we have a, a further larger meta loop of re reinforcement around driving down further um, uh, the, the pressure on decision-making timeline. 
So this stuff can get really entrenched. Hard to break these cycles if you don't address everything kind of all at once. Uh, we've already talked about the open loop nature of that relationship between time horizons. I hear something really interesting and in a way validating, which is this, uh, these two meatball machines tend to operate in opposition. And that wasn't planned when we put this model together, but it came out of the model. And, and, um, and they're separated by a trust gap, so a delay, but it's interesting that they tend to work in opposition. And that's because you wouldn't, ex just as you'd expect, a, a, a healthy organization will tend to encourage innovation and discourage incidents and vice versa. So there's that trust gap. And now uh, the good news is that this diagram also points to some, some potential points for solutions, some leverage points for solutions. And we don't, it's outside the scope of this and I'm already going over time here. So I, I can't talk about solutions. My paper talks about them. Uh, but for the causal loop diagram nerds in the room, I'll just quickly point out what we do to rewire. So the first meaningful interaction we typically have with a client is to rewire that incidence machine. And we do that with something called human factors based in, uh, investigations, which are based on the Naval Safety Center's um, investigation program. And essentially what it does by definition is force a deep dive into the why. Okay, so yes, that guy didn't turn the valve. Why did that make sense at the time? The fundamental philosophy behind human factors investigations is that everybody's doing what makes sense. Nobody's trying to get in trouble. Nobody's trying to turn the plan over. Nobody's trying to do anything wrong. They're all trying to do and be successful on behalf of themselves and on behalf of the organization. So why did what they do make sense? And if you start asking that question, Inevitably, you find your way back to culture and leadership issues. Uh, and as a result of that, the tendency to blame proximal causes and operators goes away. And uh, really, in a kind of a cool way, what happens is that sign on the findings depth gets flipped. And that change fundamentally changes the nature of this thing. The more investigations you have, uh, the, the more incidents you have, the more you're motivated if you have this kind of program in place to go, okay, we haven't been digging deep enough. We don't really understand what's going on. We need, need to dig deeper. So that now changes this to a nested reinforcing loop. So incidents don't go away, but they don't fly away either. Uh, so profoundly, it turns on the systems thinking lights for people, starts to, and it's the cornerstone for the beginning of a journey towards a disciplined learning organization. So it's a, it's a foundational beginning for, uh, for these types of organizations. And I'm way out of time, so thanks for your attention. So, are we still live streaming? Okay, so uh, I know we were scheduled to end at noon, and it's five afternoon, and so I have this theory that if I talk faster than light, we'll actually go back in time, and we can get there, no, okay, all right. Well, um, uh, this has been, once again, a great um, opportunity for you, me to present my work, because it really does build on things that uh, Adrian and uh, Burl talked about. Um, uh, and you'll see why that is when I talk to you about where I get my ideas for st strategy that travels uh, from and what I intend to say here. Um, I figure also being asked to talk about strategy that travels is why you get the last presentation um, in front of everybody because everybody's going to be traveling back to their various areas and I hope uh, taking learning uh, from this to go forward. Um, uh, I also recognized in the work that uh, I'm part of the MIT Strategy Implementation Research Project with Vic, and that we complement one another very much because Vic is always thinking about principles and theory, and I'm thinking about theory and practices. So how do we put our theory into practice? And what you're going to see and hear here uh, that I want to talk about is um, 
uh, how some of the theory and practice that I developed from previous work uh, applies to the strategy implementation gap. So for a strategy that travels, um, I ask the question of what does it take for us to give strategy wings, meaning this, this notion that uh, strategy will fly in the organization and move to different parts of it. Um, I have a Deming quote too, isn't that interesting? So uh, not unusual because we recognize what a deep thinker uh, Deming was, I think, in this territory. And then those of us that are trying to do work to it are drawn to it. I won't um, read the whole quote. Uh, Deming was right in what you said, too, where fear is a basic problem. If you can't drive out fear, I remember that's one of the things. I had the opportunity to see Deming when he came to MIT. He came and did a lecture uh, here one time. Um, and my background work is in organizational learning, systems thinking, systems dynamic, uh, large system change, uh, enterprise change, and now an ecosystem change. The bottom line here from Deming's work is, uh, there it is, we need to be guided by new knowledge, otherwise we just dig a deeper hole. So part of the question is what's going to drive us uh, to being guided by new knowledge? And what I am talking about is a research project that took me 10 years to do, uh, and the basic uh, challenge that I had there was um, how do we move from change within organizations to change across organizations? And by the way, the Deming quote also reminded me that if we're going to have a strategy that travels, uh, we have to have people with wings that are empowered to move that strategy. And we'll, we'll end on that note. Um, so I'm going to talk about my uh, research, what I learned about what happens when we go from organizations to enterprises. I will talk a little bit about systems change management and then the application to the strategy implementation gap. And I'm going to try to do it really quick. So uh, this is a basic slide that I've used for years that uh, the notion of how business gets conducted has changed dramatically. We're talking about uh, complex networked enterprises. Uh, these enterprises create a new context for uh, uh, change because all of them need to be able to improve, change, and learn. Um, and the challenge, of course, is um, how do we get there? Uh, what enables us to manage and optimize our activities uh, within an organization and what's different about uh, when we have an enterprise view, which is the high-performing model. Um, so we've gone from change and learning with a focus on a single organization uh, with characteristics of hierarchy, organization, highly organized, tightly coupled, the efficiency uh, focus to the new organizational form, which is a value stream, multi-organization enterprise, uh, transitioning across legal boundaries, but creating a new set of uh, practices. And what we see is these, uh, these enterprises are polycentric, meaning having multiple centers of power based on relationships and loosely coupled, even though maybe the processes are uh, tightly coupled. Uh, in terms of how we produce that value. So there are different assumptions about change and its concept. Uh, the question was, can we really bootstrap from our existing knowledge, um, and how do we develop a change theory that's developed and tested in enterprises? And that was essentially uh, the task that I did over those 10 years. Um, it took partly that long because it's hard to study enterprises. They're big things that take a long time to change. Uh, the implications of the difference between organizations and enterprises comes down to uh, different change processes, uh, stages of change, which in many ways are opposite to one another. So you have change that happens at the organization as well as the enterprise level, and being able to recognize what some of those differences are. Um, uh, so neither approach to change is actually uh, appropriate, but you need a new combined approach. Uh, and the uh, two approaches I have there are the traditional uh, Cotter model, the uh, unfreeze uh, model and refreeze, or the learning model, the Senge model. And part of the question was, how do we put those together? Uh, and how do we do that based on um, 
learning from organizations that have done it. So this is the book, Systems Change Management, that came out in 2015. Uh, these are some of the chapters that are there. Um, I'm going to go through that quickly because what I want to just then uh, do is apply that to strategy to implementation gap. So we see some can do it. Uh, they have practices around awareness of their enterprise, the larger system, innovating in sets, meaning that we don't just manage one type of change, but we manage boundary process and restructuring change at the same time. Uh, we find ways that the um, plan change and learning change process complement one another. Uh, we see that as, as people and capabilities grow, the business needs to grow, so that uh, that's a positive way uh, to drive the structure, um, and that it depends upon the ability of leadership to uh, distribute the capabilities uh, that enable that. And that becomes a larger system uh, with those principles, and there is a process for sustaining that. So uh, the work really uh, was based on a series of uh, cases that developed uh, combinations of tools, processes, uh, and methods to be able to make those changes. Those were in the form of what I had just mentioned, the idea of tools that enable us to see our enterprise mapping tools, uh, much like what Adrian uh, presented. Uh, thinking about change as a set, so we know that process change gives us new capabilities, may lead to restructuring, may lead to um, acquisitions and mergers. Uh, the same with uh, learning and plan change the ability to seek growth, what are uh, abilities to drive the process, not just by cost optimization uh, or cost control, because that enables us to approach new markets, but rather than put the risk on the workforce to first cut costs, then go for new markets, put the risk on management to say, we can, uh, we can lower our costs because I have the um, uh, confidence that uh, our workforce can actually achieve that. Um, and therefore, we will uh, operate that way. And then finally, the notion of distributing leadership uh, is the idea of working in and on the system, that leaders provide an important role in um, putting together the set of practices that do that. So um, each of these change capabilities maps into some ideas for uh, strategy to implementation adaptation. So uh, how do we represent the timing and the process of strategy and its implementation such that uh, we can see that? How do we think about uh, guiding implementation uh, around the series of changes that are there? Uh, what do we do for learning processes? How do we drive our uh, uh, implementation uh, that where people see opportunities for growth in their own development, and what's the role of leaders uh, in um, recognizing the autonomy that people have in the organization to carry out that strategy. And so uh, a big part of the question is how do we operationalize this? How is it achieved? Um, and that's largely been done by what um, academics have called parallel learning structures and what others have called um, the Toyota way, the Danaher business systems, communities of practice, uh, essentially efforts led by leaders that uh, have them uh, develop uh, their people within the organization. So you see the operating structure there, and you see beneath that you put in place a parallel system that focuses on uh, learning as part of the improvement process. And I've got uh, Toyota. Um, by the way, one, one of the only ways that Uber was able to grow as fast as it was is Uber had a playbook. So how it could quickly move from one geography and who, what it had to do that it developed and taught uh, and uh, allowed it to succeed. So uh, I think the notion is what's the, what's the playbook for strategy implementation and how do uh, organizations encourage and develop that. And that, in a sense, is foundation for some other work that's going on, which is um, how do we lead systems? And a big part of leading systems comes back to this uh, parallel learning system idea and playbook uh, with the idea that in order to lead systems, we need to think about the set of practices, tools, and frameworks uh, that enable that. And it becomes important for every organization to um, develop that capability in its parallel learning system. And in fact, we are building what we call a social Bauhaus, which is tools 
theories and methods that can be assembled into uh, a parallel learning system that then gets taught. So we would draw upon causal loop diagramming, we would draw upon many of the other practices that are there and help organizations uh, develop that and that becomes one of the key leadership functions. So um, uh, that's uh, my concluding slide. I believe that, that strategy will travel when we enable people in their learning processes uh, with, uh, with toolkits that enable them to learn and grow uh, collectively. my microphone. So first of all, thank you. Um, please join with me uh, in, in thanking our previous five presenters. Uh, just, just to quickly editorialize, we're not terribly late. But you know, we started off uh, with Vic talking about principles and, um, and, and establishing the, the right go uh, goals and objectives uh, using two by using framework. And I think the subsequent uh, presentations that we had really drilled down into the by using and subject to aspects of establishing those goals. That it matters, you know, what uh, assumptions and processes you use in in planning the project, you know, whether it's robust or not. That communication structures and leadership are very important. Uh, that uh, the the types of uh, climate that are, are are created by management and their priorities uh, have, a, have a significant impact. So uh, what's interesting about systems is we design them and then they do something you don't expect. And, and we learn a lot from those things that you don't expect. And it's usually those details that we didn't pay attention to when we established the initial design that caused the, the, the challenges. So um, as, you, as you have lunch, uh, uh, please reflect on not only the uh, establishing the goals and objectives, but also you know what it is about the systems, the social systems, organizational systems that we're designing, and and the specific design attributes that we create as we uh, uh, create these organizations for execution and Im implementation. Uh, I think Brian, you were going to tell us about what happens next, but uh, essentially we're done in this room now. We're going to head across the way to the Sandberg Center where we had lunch yesterday. Uh, and then the rest of the day's activities will take place over there. So if you have any uh, belongings, please take them with you. Uh, we're just a couple of minutes behind schedule, but uh, so, so boogie on over to the Sandberg Center. Don't uh, delay. You might even take the stairs like I did yesterday. A little winded at the top, but fitter for the, for the effort. And uh, we'll see you over there. Thank you. <laughs>